when we try to look at mass spectrometry, there are certain points that needs to be kept in mind. And those points will also make you understand that mass spectrometry is much, much different than the other spectroscopic methods that we discuss, particularly the UV visible spectroscopy, IR spectroscopy, NMR spectroscopy. And so, what are the differences that make mass spectrometry different from these spectroscopic methods? First thing is that mass spectrometry helps us to find out the molecular weight and can be obtained from a very small sample. So, the som sample size can be as small as possible and yet we can get the molecular weight of the compound. It does not involve the absorption or emission of light. So, it is not a true spectroscopy method. Why? Because there is no absorption of light or emission of light. So, what, how does it function? What is the role that excites a molecule and how does the spectrum, mass spectrum come into picture? A beam of high energy electron breaks the molecule apart. The masses of the fragments and their relative abundance reveal information about the structure of the molecule. So, time and again ever since I have been discussing GCMS and later on even in the beginning of this lecture I had said that any organic molecule consists of bonds. Now, these bonds can be you know uh, some of them are strong bonds and some of them are weak bonds. It is only the weak bonds that will break in the fragmentation pattern initially. And as and when the molecule breaks into smaller fragments, still smaller fragments will be formed under high energy system. So, the initial breaking of the molecule to molecular ion is only possible from the beam of electron bombarding the, at, uh, the molecule. So, that is very important to be understood and this initial bombardment actually creates molecular ion peak and then the molecular ion peak according to its bonding the weak bonds or the labile bonds first break up and give fragments. Then comes why the lines are short and long. The relative abundance of these fragments would depend upon all the rules that you have learned about the stability of that particular cation and therefore, one must remember that there are the more stable the cation or the fragment, the more uh, long will be the line or the relative abundance of that particular fragment will be higher than the others. Mass spectrometry, the main use of mass spectrometry is in organic chemistry to determine the molecular mass of an organic compound, to determine the molecular formula of the organic compound and therefore, how is it achieved. So, the two functions are very important, one is to find out what is the molecular formula and the other thing is that what is the molecular mass of a substance. How do we achieve this? Persuade the molecules to enter the vapor phase, this can be a little difficult, produce ions from the molecules that enter the gas phase and then separate the ions according to their mass to charge ratio that is m by z. So, these are the main functions that happen in a mass spectrometer. We have learned a while ago that there is an ion source which bombards the molecule, then there is an analyzer which analyzes these different fragments according to their mass to charge ratio and then there is a detector. So, separate the ions according to their mass to charge ratio that is m by z 
and measure and record these ions. So, these, these are the four functions that happen in a mass spectrometer. Ionizing methods we have already discussed, but I would like to repeat here that you know in order for you to recap and to be able to comprehend what is a uh, hard method, what is a soft method and so on. The first and the most popular method which most of the mass spectrometers have as an ionizing method is the electron impact. It is high energy electrons at about 20 electro volt. The beam of electron is made to bombard the molecule and that is why it is very harsh method. Chemical ionization or low energy methods are also possible. Electron impact method when there is a molecule which is methane, methane when it is bombarded with electron, it produces CH3 plus dot which is a methyl cation, radical cation and two electrons are ejected out. These two electrons then act, uh, participate in bombarding the other particles as well. Therefore, this now methyl radical cation then gives away hydrogen radical and becomes methyl cation alone and that is how the methyl cation then further uh, is uh, gives away its charge to hydrogen radical and that is how the impact actually breaks the molecule into different fragments. Of course, because it was a simple molecule methane, it appears very simplified. I chose this example mainly to make you understand that how a radical cation is first formed with the initial bombardment of the electron and then the radical cation then gets converted into cation and radical and finally, there is a propagation process that takes place. The bond breaking occurs and the only cations are carried to the detector. Why? Because charged species tend to move and when they move they generate an electrical and magnetic field and because of their mass to charge ratio they are deflected towards the de de detector. Mass of methane, one would find a molecular ion or a base peak at 16 because C H 4, C is 12 and H is 4, so it makes 14 uh, sorry 16 and then from that when one hydrogen is eliminated it forms a peak at 15. So, the one would find according to methane only two major peaks uh, and those would be at 16 and 15 AMU. Now, from this you will also understand that just the way where we had in NMR a TMS which was the starting point. To, from TMS all other protons were towards the left hand side. Similarly, molecular ion peak is the actual molecular weight of the substance because only one electron has been lost, it is a radical cation and therefore, from this molecular ion peak all other fragments will fall on the left hand side and will be smaller in number in terms of their mass to charge ratio. Mass measurement takes about 20 microseconds, many fragmentations occur during this process. So, you see that the time required for this bombardment and the fragments to be formed is very, very small and therefore, it is one method which is very fast and very efficient for the fragmentation of molecules. So, what does a typical mass look like? Let us try to take uh, uh, an example of uh, alarm pheromone of honey bee and a typical mass spectrum shows that it has a relative abundance base peak gives 100 percent abundance and there are other examples or other situations. 
Now you will see that molecular ion peak is at 114 and it shows two small peaks attached to 114 which will be at 1 mass unit extra and 2 mass unit extra. Now, this is actually arriving from the fact that this pheromone has a, a such an element which appears in 3 isotopic concentration in nature and that is why the peak does not come as single molecular ion peak, but is attached to 2 small ones which are due to the isotopic effect and therefore, they are called isotope peaks. So, note that when uh, 114 is the molecular ion peak and when 71 is deducted from it, uh, the m by z fragment that is obtained is 43 and that is the most stable fragment of this alarm pheromone of honey bee. Why? Because it all the stability rules of this particular moiety holds good and makes it a very stable fragment. Note that 43 is uh, the mass of the radical which is most stabilized. Now, electron impact ionization, a high energy electron can dislodge an electron from a bond creating a radical cation, a positive ion with an unpaired electron. So, what is a radical cation? A radical cation is a cation having one um, electron, unpaired electron and that is what is generated first and the foremost when an electron beam impacts on the molecule. Therefore, only one electron is ejected out and they, it gives the molecular ion peak. So, if we take an example of ethane now and there is an electron impact, it will give rise to ethyl radical cation and subsequently it will give rise to ethyl cation and therefore, the ethyl cation will then stabilize and form methyl cation and uh, radical uh, methyl radical and that will go on. Separation of ions. Now, what happens? Because we have been talking that separation of ions and reaching to the detector is governed by the fact that the mass to charge ratio, the smaller ones will reach first, then the medium ones and then the highest ones. Only the cations are deflected by the magnetic field. Why? Because charged particles have a tendency to take a tra trajectory movement because of the electrical and the magnetic field that they create around themselves and that helps them to move towards the detector. The amount of deflection depends on the m by z. As I said, the smaller will first reach the detector and therefore, the medium will go after that and the highest will reach at the end. So, that discriminates the smallest particle and the amount of all those smallest particle that are generated through the fragmentation pattern reaching the detector. The detector signal is proportional to the number of ions hitting it. So, the detector is a very sensitive detector and any signal which is coming is registered and it or the number of registries that are made are actually dependent on the number of impacts that occur. So, the, uh, it is proportional to the number of ions that are reaching the detector. By varying the magnetic field, ion of all masses are collected and counted. So, what happens is that when the magnetic field is altered, the ions of all the masses gradually get uh, detected, move towards the detector and they get collected and they are accounted or they are uh, numbered. Now, this is how the mass spectrometer looks like. There is a probe, there is an ion source and here is a beam of electron and the beam of electron is actually bombarding the ion source. 
Now, I must also tell you that samples must be in ga gaseous phase or vapor phase in order to have a very efficient uh, uh, impact with the electron beam. And then the electron, the ion beam that is generated is passed through a magnet where it is deflected because of the electrical charge that these ions are carrying. Ions that are too light bend too much and ions that are too heavy bend too little. So, there is a flight tube through which it passes. Only ions of the right, uh, right mass can enter the detector. So, if they are too light or too heavy, they will get deflected. They will not reach the detector properly. Only the ions with the right mass at a time reach the detector. Then there are detector slits through which they enter the detector and then they are amplified and uh, the recorder then actually records the spectrum. Now, the whole system has to be under very high vacuum, otherwise this deflection will not take place in such a facile manner. A typical mass spectrum, you will see that it is first and the foremost thing that you see in a spectrum uh, of mass spectrometry is that it is a line spectrum. Masses are graphed or tabulated according to their relative abundance. Second thing that you must remember is that they are appearing according to their relative abundance. Relative abundance is related to the stability of that fragment. So, the more stable the fragment, the higher will be the peak in the uh, spectrum. So, when we look at the base peak or the strongest peak almost like uh, 100 percent, that particular fragment is expected to be more stable. Then comes 57 and the molecular ion peak appears at 100. It is a, the compound is 2,4-dimethyl pentane. 2,4-dimethyl pentane loses 15 AMU to become 85 and this is by the loss of CH3 group. So, one of the methyl gets chopped off and finally, it gets further chopped off and further chopped off till it comes to uh, relative uh, abundance uh, highest peak of 41 and 43 and that is the most stable configuration of the fragment and therefore, it shows relative abundance as 100 percent almost. Now, we had talked about GCMS. What exactly is the arrangement? How is the GC attached to the mass uh, spectrometer is shown pictorially here. A mixture of compound is separated by gas chromatography, particularly the volatile compounds, then identified by mass spectrometry. And you will find that the helium is the carrier gas and it uh, the compound is injected through the injector in GC and then it goes through the column for its separation process and at the point of interface, it is connected to the mass speed, uh, spectrometer and enters the ion phase. At this point, there is an electrical, uh, there is a electron beam which is uh, bombarding the molecule and then through the ma uh, mass filter different sized fragments that is the uh, differently uh, m by z fragments start moving towards the detector and as what I mentioned that smaller ones will reach faster than the uh, medium ones and the medium ones will reach faster than the uh, heavier ones. High resolution mass is also possible, masses are measured uh, to one part in 20,000. A molecule with masses of 44 could be C3H8, it could be C2H4O or CO2 or CN2H4. So, if there is a mass which is appearing at 44 AMU, these are the four or there are even more possibilities. Why? Because when you make a summation of C3, it is 36 plus 8 is 44. Similarly, if you make a summation of C 2 H 4 O, it will be uh, 24 plus 4 plus 16. And similarly, for C O 2, it will be 12 plus 
32 and so on and so forth. One can add up and find that it totals up to 44 AMU. If a more exact mass is 44.029, pick the correct structure from the table. Now, you will see that C3H8, the total, the accurate up to 4 or 5 places of decimal works out to be 44.06. For C2H4O, the most accurate value comes to 44.026. Similarly, for carbon dioxide, it works out to be 43.9898 and for C N 2 H 4, it works out to be 44.037. So, obviously, it is the molecule closest to the C 2 H 4 O. Molecules with heteroatoms. Now, the isotopes I just mentioned you a while ago will also contribute and will be shown on the mass spectrum. One cannot escape seeing the isotopes if they are present in substantial quantity isotopes present in their usual abundance. Hydrocarbons contain 1.1 percent of C13. So, there will be a very small m plus 1 peak which will be almost negligible. Like 1 percent of carbon 13, we have uh, already uh, seen the relative intensities of these two isotopes when we were doing NMR spectroscopy. And therefore, for hydrocarbons, this m plus 1 peak will be almost uh, non-traceable. Nevertheless, it will appear as a small noise. But if Br is present, the m plus 2 is almost equal to m because the isotopes are almost equivalent. Similarly, for, for chlorine, the m plus 2 is almost one third of the molecular ion peak. So, one has to remember that in the case of Br and chlorine that is bromide and chloride, one cannot neglect the isotopic peaks and they are characteristic also. It is an additional uh, uh, or an added advantage that if the compound has a bromine atom in the molecule or if the compound has a chlorine atom in the molecule, the mass spectrum will definitely reflect these in the molecular ion peak and subsequently in the daughter uh, fragments also till these uh, groups are completely eliminated from the fragment. If iodine is present peak at 127, the large gap will be obtained and if nitrogen is present, m plus will be an odd number. So, this these are certain very, very important and um, very characteristics of mass spectrum. So, therefore, it is also diagnostic to be able to identify that the compound has a bromine group or a chlorine group or an iodine group and so much so that, that if it contains nitrogen, the, uh, it, the m plus will always be an odd number. If sulfur is present, m plus 2 will be almost 4 percent of the molecular ion peak. So, you see that whether we have heteroatoms which are of the halogen series or whether we have heteroatoms like nitrogen and sulfur, the molecular ion peak shows some kind of special characteristic and therefore, one can find another line or it will be an odd number as mentioned to you. Now, when we try to look at the isotopic abundance of some elements, the it is uh, seen that hydrogen does not show any uh, relative abundances. Uh, the m ion is only 1 because the m plus 1 and the m 2 are in very trace quantities that is deuterium and tritium. Uh, hydrogen exists more mainly as the protein, proton. Carbon has a relative abundance of C12 98.9 percent and C13 as 1.1 percent. Similarly, nitrogen 14 is 99.6 percent and N15 is 0 0.0, uh, 0.4 percent. Oxygen 16 is 99.8 percent, it does not have another isotope. Sulfur 32 is 95 percent 
and sulfur 33 is 0 0.8 percent and there is a third isotope which is 4.2 percent sulfur 34, chlorine 35 is 75.5 percent and chlorine 37 M plus 2 is 24.5 percent. Similarly, bromine 79 is 50.5 percent and bromine M plus 2 81 is 49.5 percent. That is why two equal size peaks will be seen for bromine. Iodine is only one isotope that one will find that it has 127 as 100 percent. Therefore, these give an idea that if in a mass spectrum, if we find these kind of you know small peaks appearing with the molecular ion peak, one can expect the presence of these heteroatoms. Now, we have taken a typical example of a compound containing sulfur. You will see that it is a sulphide, it is an ethyl methyl sulphide and you will find that the M plus 2 appears fairly uh, and it is very apparent because the molecular ion peak which is appearing at 76 which is demarked by the M plus sign shows two significant small lines at M plus 2 large enough to be noticed. Similarly, if we try to look at the mass spectrum with chlorine, we will find that a chloride uh, which is uh, dimethyl uh, uh, pentane sorry dimethyl propyl chloride, the molecular ion peak is at 78, but at M plus 2 there is a peak which is appearing almost one third the size of the M plus. Though, so, therefore, it is rightly so that the, the difference between the M and the M plus 2 is in the ratio of 3 is to 1 and it, they also appear in relative abundance of their isotopic concentrations. So, if we try to look at the mass spectrum of a bromide molecule with or a molecule having bromine, we should expect the molecular ion peak and the M plus 2 almost equivalent and rightly so, this compound CH3, CH2, CH2 Br shows a molecular ion peak at 122 and there is a M plus 2 almost of the equivalent height. Why? Because the relative abundance of the two isotope is 50.5 and 49.5. Then when we try to look at the mass spectra of alkane, more stable carbocations will be more abundant. I just explained to you that all the rules of stability will be applicable for these cationic fragments. And so, whatever you have learned as the stabilizing factor for any carbocation will be applicable even when we are studying mass spectrum. And therefore, the relative abundance of that particular carbocation will be highest because it has the stabilizing factor and therefore, does not lose the charge very easily. When we try to look at the molecule 2-methyl pentane, you will see that the first fragmentation that takes place, the molecular ion peak is at 86 and the first fragmentation that takes place is M minus 15. Why? Because the methyl group gets chopped off and that is the most labile bond that will take place uh, to be broken off. And then subsequently there is a loss of 29 which is, which is CH3, CH2 and so the, 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 the derivative from the 86 molecular ion peak, the most stable fragment will be 43. So, this is how the uh, rule of stabilization of carbocation are truly applicable in the case of these fragments mass spectra of alkene. They are stabilized by resonance, stabilized cations are more favored and therefore, when there is an allylic position, there is a CH2 that will break and form the allyl cation 
rather because the positive charge on the CH2 can be easily um, you know conjugate uh, is in conjugation with the electrons of the double bond and therefore, it is a more stable cation and when we try to look at the example of trans 2 hexene, the molecular ion peak appears at 84 which is m plus and then the subsequent loss is uh, by the loss of ethyl uh, group which is uh, uh, then giving a very relatively high relative abundance of 55 is 100 percent which means that there is an additional stabilizing factor and the stabilizing factor for this kind of allylic cations is due to resonance. So, with this we have come to an end of the mass spectroscopic method. Nevertheless, the story does not end here. Several, several compounds can be analyzed by this spa, mass spectrometric method. I will try to take you to another course of uh, quickly going through uh, an array of compounds, which will give you an insight about how these mass spectrometric analysis can be extended to proteonomics. If we try to quickly look at the mass spectrometric methods and theory, you will find that these can be even extended very uh, extensively to proteonomics tools, molecular biology tools, separation and display tools, protein identification tools and protein structure tools. So, it is not that only organic compounds can be analyzed by this method. Very, very intricate, very large macromolecules like proteins, peptides also can be analyzed uh, with lot of uh, great specification. Mass spectrometry of course, here needs little bit of manipulation, because now the task is more difficult ionization, how the protein is injected in the ma MS machine, because as I was telling organic compounds are transferred to the machine ma mass spectrometer by converting the compound into the gaseous state that is the vapor phase, but how can a protein then be transferred that is a big challenge. Then how does the separation take place? the mass and charge, how are they determined on the protein molecule. Activation, proteins are broken into smaller fragments that is they are broken down into peptides and subsequently these peptides are then broken down into amino acid. Therefore, how does the mass determination really take place? M by Z ratios are determined for the ionized protein fragments and peptides. So, still they are very large fragments, but they are able to be identified, because they are ionized in their molecular state. Several methods have been identified and developed for protein identification. The MALDI S that means the, the 2 D G E plus MALDI M S is actually used for peptide mass fingerprinting. Then another method that is used where MS and MS I had mentioned a while ago are coupled for peptide sequencing, fragment ion searching, multidimensional LC when it is coupled with MS and MS. It is able to do a more intricate study and a de novo peptide sequencing is possible mass spectrometer remains the same, introduce sample to the instrument, generate ion in the gas, gas phase, separate ions on the basis of the difference in m by z with a mass analyzer and this is how the, the you know the breaking up or the ionization should be done either by ESI method or EI method or MALDI method or FAB method, the, these are the only possible methods and then the ions are made to pass through an analyzer which could be a quadripole 
which could be time of flight, which could be iron trap and subsequently it reaches the detector where the information is then passed on to the recorder. The entire system as uh, what you know must be under very high vacuum. How does mass spectrometer work? We have already looked at it, but we will take a quick look to have a recap. Ions have to be created and for creation of ions from a neutral molecule, the substance must be first changed into vapor phase or ga ga gaseous phase. And then the ionization methods could be for particularly for protein only two soft methods are recommended. One is the MALD that is matrix assisted laser desorption ionization or electrospray ionization. Then separation of these ions can be done by using mass analyzers that is MALD time of flight or triple quadrupole or MALDI quadrupole and TOF put together and several types of uh, analyzers may be used for a particular purpose. If only the molecular weight has to be determined, MALDI and time of flight analyzer is good enough. But if the amino acid sequencing has to be done, then triple quadrupole is what is the basic requirement. Similarly, if the atom, if the amino acid sequencing as well as molecular weight has to be uh, calculated, then MALDI with a quadrupole and time of flight analyzers must be used. And then finally, they are detected by the detector. Mass spectrum is created and then database is also generated and kept for further analysis. A generalized protein identification by MS. So, one can make a lot of adjustments to do this complicated protein molecule analysis and therefore, one has to make certain adaptation. So, it is spotted on the uh, from the gel fragment, uh, fragmented using trypsin and then the spectrum of the fragments are generated and furthermore they are then matched with the library and therefore it is seen whether the sequence is matching with any of the known peptide sequences or whether it is a completely new kind of molecule. So, you see that I tried to give you an overview of the entire use of uh, mass spectrometry including the organic molecules, the simplified molecules and even the toughest of the tough biological molecules like peptides which and proteins which are very intricate system of huge number of amino acids and monomers. So, one can appreciate all these spectroscopic methods in a very fine manner and as what I will repeat once again that no single method is a foolproof method. It is with the help of all these spectroscopic method that when can, one can determine the structure of any compound, whether be it organic compound or biological sample.